Stonehenge, Takao, Muyil, Giza, Dendera, Rome. When Stonehenge was built 5,000 years ago by the mysterious Druid people, they selected a seemingly random site in the Salisbury Plain in what's now known as England to construct their megalithic masterpiece. What was the purpose of their generations of toil? Perhaps we'll never know. Tikal, one of the great legendary sacred sites of Mesoamerica, the ancient Maya, known as master mathematicians, astronomers, people who could measure the world, know the cosmos and what laid beyond. Muyil, near modern day Tulum, connected to other Maya sites through an advanced network of underground cisterns. It was the Aztec deity Quetzalcoatl who was known as the Great One who first measured the Earth. For the Mesoamericans, the Maya and Aztec, it was considered godlike to know the Earth and cosmos. The Giza Plateau in modern day Egypt, perhaps the most controversial and famous of all the seven wonders of the ancient world. When exactly were they built and for what purpose? Isaac Newton, the famous physicist and scientist said that the builders of the pyramids had an understanding of physics well beyond their years and an understanding of the stars. Dendera, the temple of Hathor, the beautiful hieroglyphics depicting the Egyptian goddess in all of her splendor. People would come worship at Dendera to imbue themselves with a little bit of what it was meant to be godlike, to partake in community and connectivity. These hieroglyphs depict how the Egyptians lived. The Roman Forum, in many ways a cesspool, in many ways a place where entrepreneurial dreams were scattered on the battlefield, like at the Colosseum. This was where merchants, peasants, and aristocrats interacted, connected. This was the innovation hub of the ancient world. This is Prop Moto, and this is Building the Future. Welcome everybody to New York City Real Estate Tech Week. My name's Zach Ahrens. This is Prop Moto, Building the Future. So why are we talking about the past when we're building the future? What are we doing here? Why are we all so grateful to be here? It's not freezing cold. It's still a beautiful day. We're here at the Time Center in Midtown Manhattan, yet we're talking about megalithic monuments and masterpieces, things like Stonehenge, Giza, Tikal, Muyil. Why are we talking about the ancient world when we want to be moving forward? We want to be thinking about innovation, about the future of our cities. Well, the main reason is because I believe the ancients understood a level of connectivity, a level of what we call innovation, a level of what we call information and control of energy that we're only now potentially beginning to grasp with what we would now call technology. I alluded to it a little bit before, but it seems, it just seems, with their construction of Stonehenge or the Egyptians' construction of the pyramids, that they understood their place in the world. And I don't just mean understand in a metaphorical way. I mean they understood it in a literal, physical way. How is this possible? The truth is, I don't really know, but I'm looking into it. Perhaps the greatest entrepreneur, 
inventor, innovator of the modern world, Nikola Tesla, understood this energy that the ancients seemed to be able to harness. He understood that if you took the water from underground cisterns, the sun, the wind, stone, and the human mind and the human energy, you could create a level of connectivity and awareness that we can't even fathom today. Nikola Tesla said, to truly understand the universe, one should understand vibration, frequency, and energy. Vibration, frequency, and energy. What did Tesla mean by that? What did the man known as the master of lightning, the inventor of so many things, including uh, alternating current, perhaps the most important innovation of our day. What did he mean? Well, I think what he meant is that matter, all matter is, all physical things are just energy vibrating and oscillating at different frequencies. And if we can tune ourselves to those frequencies, we can feel a level of connectivity a level of innovation, and a level of technology that maybe the ancients were hinting at. Maybe the Druid builders of Stonehenge knew a little bit more about than we do. When Tesla's mother died, the moment she died, he had a vision in his sleep of her death. He woke up, he knew she was dead. How did he know this? Is it a coincidence? It could be. Or as he said, they were tuned to the same frequency. Nikola Tesla and his mom were tuned to the same frequency. So why does this matter? Why does this matter for building the future? Why does this matter for the future of our cities and humanity and society? Well, there's a term called collective consciousness. Collective consciousness was coined in the 19th century by a French philosopher and sociologist named Emile Durkheim. What he was talking about was the idea that there are, I, there are things, ideas, kernels of wisdom, of truth, of knowledge, of innovation that are floating in the ether, that are floating in the ecosystem. People are conceiving of the same ideas right now in Shanghai that we are today in New York, even though I may not be directly calling that person on the phone or directly communicating with them in any way. Durkheim was talking about a post-industrial world, but we can apply that, I believe, to our world in the 21st century. So let's talk about some examples of collective consciousness throughout KISS history and how they relate to modern day conceptions of entrepreneurship. Isaac Newton, very famous philosopher, very famous physicist, very famous mathematician. Around 1699, he got in a brutal feud with another brilliant mathematician named Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz, who had come from Leipzig, Germany. It was over the concept of calculus. Now, neither of them invented calculus, but both of them at the exact same time, without knowing each other or even of each other, discovered calculus. How is this possible? Well, I believe calculus at the time was floating within the collective consciousness. It was floating in the ether. They got in a brutal feud over who actually discovered it. In 1611, Sunspots, the first blemishes ever found in our cosmos. We believed before sunspots that everything was perfect out there. Totally perfect, unblemished. The first sunspots, both discovered simultaneously in the year 1611. Galileo Galilei discovered them in Italy, simultaneously with a German astronomer named Johannes Fabricius. I can go through centuries and centuries and centuries of these examples. But what they underscore 
is that you can either believe that this exists or you can believe that there are so many random coincidences over and over and over again. I want to give one specific example that's a little bit more relevant to what we do at Metaprop. What we do every day is we try to track the collective consciousness. We try to figure out where trends are going. People at PropMoto do the very same thing. There's an entrepreneur, his name is Zach Lawless. Great name, right? I only fund entrepreneurs named Zach. <laughs> Bias. But Zach Lawless had an interesting experience that he consented to having me share with you today because it involves and underscores this idea of collective consciousness and this feeling that we're all tethered together by some sort of energy that we don't quite understand. And maybe those who built the pyramids and built Stonehenge could teach us a thing or two about. Zach Lawless was studying in college. He was a budding entrepreneur. He had a brilliant idea. He took a bath like Archimedes, and he had his eureka moment where he leapt out of the bath. His eureka moment was for a company called Farmery. Farmery was going to be the precision, the tiny ingredients of a pharmacy mixed with the deliciousness of a farm. That's right, everybody. Before the meal kit craze, this was an online meal kit company. Zach Lawless believed he was the first and only person who had ever thought of this idea. He entered it into a school business plan, was really ready to tackle it, launch it, bought the domain name even. Then he was bored one day and he flipped on the TV and he watched one of his favorite shows. He's a budding entrepreneur. He loves, loves, loved the show Shark Tank. And he saw a company pitch. The company was called Plated. The entrepreneur was named Nick Toronto. Nick Toronto pitched Plated and got funded. He got funded on Shark Tank for his idea. What was his idea? It was meal kits. What did Zach Lawless do? Ah, I can't believe it. Nick Toronto, I've never met this guy. He grew up in a totally different place than me. We have nothing in common other than we're both alive at the same time. Yet he stole my idea. How could he have stolen my idea? Anyway, he was annoyed, but still determined to make it in the world. So he forgot about farmery. He said, you know what? I'm going to keep my head down. I'm going to look for new opportunities. Fast forward, it's four years later. Zach Lawless finds himself with a new company. The new company is called Fresh Bowl. The new company opens its first location in the financial district in Manhattan. Zach Lawless is there one day, he's stressed out. Oh my God, I'm launching my new business also in the intersection of food, property, and technology. Similar to the meal kits, but different. What we might call a pivot. Now who does he see walking by, by chance, by random coincidence in the universe? He walks outside and who does he see walk by but a gentleman named Nick Taranto the founder and CEO of Plated, who had just sold his business successfully to the giant grocery store Albertsons. What does Zach Lawless do in this situation? Does he just say, well, that's a coincidence. That's a random thing happening in the universe. I'm just going to let Nick Toronto walk right by. I'm not going to say anything to him. I don't want to bother him. I'm not going to bother him during this day. Guess what? He doesn't do that. He goes outside, he pats him on the shoulder, and he says, hey, Nick. Nick's sort of taken it back. Who are you? Well, you don't know me, but I know you. And you're going to be an investor and advisor to my company, because I want your knowledge from doing this meal kit. And he laughed, and he said, OK, let's talk. And now Nick Taranto is an investor and advisor to Zach Lawless's excellent company. One of the many examples of collective consciousness, how you can leverage it in your life, how you can try to be more 
like the ancients in many ways. Be more open. Open yourself up to new ideas. They could come from anywhere. If you embrace the universe, hopefully the universe will embrace you. If you believe that all we are are just vibrations at different frequencies of energy, start vibrating toward something you want, someone you want, a goal, a dream, a place, a person, a concept, an innovation. The whole point, we're going to hear a lot about building the future later today. We're going to hear a lot about physical ways to do that, ways to engender connectivity through the built world and through technology. Let's continue to push the envelope with that, but let's not dismiss the fact that a lot of technology, a lot of consciousness, a lot of innovation, a lot of energy can be harnessed just by looking into yourself in the same way that someone thousands of years ago sitting at that pyramid at Tikal would do. So in closing, I just want to wish everybody a happy Monday morning, a happy New York City Real Estate Tech Week. I'm so excited to be here. I'm so excited you're all here. And uh, thank you very much.